Hi all, welcome to the fourth video in this series on operatic voices. In the last video we explored the very versatile mezzo-soprano and all the roles a mezzo-soprano can play in traditional opera narratives. In this video we'll be discussing the contralto. As you know, I'm currently in the process of writing an opera that includes trans voices as well as more traditional opera voices. And so, I thought I'd do some intense research into traditional voice categories and make a comprehensive lecture series about my findings. It's not like a treatise on the voice or anything. It's just a good general guide for myself and other composers wanting to know about the voices in a comprehensive manner. And maybe anyone wanting to start out being an opera singer and learning more about the voice. Of course, it's absurd to categorise everyone's voice into these labels, but these labels help us to understand vocal capabilities better and so we can understand where we might situate a person and how they might deviate from that category in whatever way. We must remember that people are human and that there will be exceptions to every rule and every category. So, without further ado, let's explore the contralto voice. Let's start by looking at the terms contralto and alto because apparently the contralto is sometimes simply called alto. And this voice type is the lowest female singing voice, in theory. There are some females out there who can sing tenor, but these words, contralto and alto, are usually used to designate female voices and the lowest female voice. But interestingly, according to Tom Huizenga, Huizenga, writing for NPR Classical Online, the terms alto and contralto are sometimes used interchangeably, but it's not that simple. Alto, strictly speaking, refers to the vocal range one rung higher than a tenor. The term goes back to the 16th century when alto parts in church music were sung only by men. So again, it's vague because it may refer to the lowest female part, but also it can refer to a higher male voice. Gender just confuses things. So, as I was saying, <laughs> it goes back to the 16th century when alto parts in church music were sung only by men. Either high tenors, falsetto singers, such as counter tenors, boys, or castrati. And castrati are those men who were surgically altered such that their voices never dropped at puberty. We also think of altos as the lower voiced women in the church choir and also in opera. But there we go, he's only talking about choral voices. Anyway, castrati were outlawed after the invention of women, but more about that in the next video. Now let's go back to what Tom Huizenga? Huizenga. I'm so sorry. I have a really badly pronounced name as well. Let's go back to what Tom, good old Tom, says about altos and contraltos. He writes that alto was the more common term until contralto, meaning against or contra alto, gave it some competition. Contraltos, range-wise, fall between the mezzo and the tenor. They are the lowest of the female voices, but not always female, as the word could also refer to a male castrato back in the early 18th century. They can sing usually down to the F below middle C and up to at least the second E above middle C. Hmm. Now let's have a look at the character types of altos, contraltos in opera. So according to sfopera.com, composers usually reserve this voice type for the older female characters possessing great wisdom. Unlike sopranos or mezzo-sopranos, it is very rare to find a true contralto, and the operatic literature contains few roles written specifically for them. Operatic literature? I guess there's few roles written specifically for contraltos? In opera. Now, contraltos are sometimes assigned feminine roles like Theodata in Flavio, Racina in The Barber of Seville, <laughs> Isabella in L'Italiana in Algeri, <laughs> and Olga in Eugene Onegin. More frequently, they play female villains or trouser roles. We've talked about trouser roles in the mezzo-soprano video. We'll look more about it later on as well. It keeps coming up. So contraltos may also be cast in roles originally written for castrati. We will have a video fully exploring the castrati, but for now, as I've mentioned, castrati are those people who surgically removed their testicles in order to retain that high voice that they were born with before they hit puberty. 
A common saying among contraltos is that they may play only witches, bitches, or britches. Ah, oh, britches because of the trouser rolls. I'd love to play a witch. They're fun. Famous contralto roles include Filipevna from Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin, Ulrika from Verdi's A Masked Ball, <laughs> Erda from Wagner's Das Rhein Gold. Now, what about famous contralto singers? According to sfopera.com again, there aren't many true contralto opera singers. I've already gone into this yes, but sfopera.com also say that a few contraltos of note include Kathleen Ferrier, Marianne Anderson and Eva Podles. Now just listen to this excerpt of Eva Podles singing Marquise of Birkenfield's aria Por un fem de monnom in Gaetano Donizetti's 1840 opera comique La Fille du Régiment. She can get solo. She sounds like a man at times. <laughs> With that being so few contraltos, it's unsurprisingly quite hard to find examples of true contralto performances. One stunning example appears in this excerpt from Sua Angelica. This is according to sfopera.com. Again, it's Eva Podles. This is where Eva Podles sings of the princess who is trying to get her niece, sister Angelica, to renounce her claim to the family fortune. <laughs> Another great example of a contralto performance is this clip from Ronita Miller's turn as Erda in Wagner's Siegfried, where she cryptically answers her lover Wotan's questions. Despite it being so difficult to find contralto roles, I have actually met a few. I sang in a cathedral choir and there was a woman who sang alto and she could sing the tenor line quite easily quite surprisingly. Mind you, but that's only one person, isn't it? There's probably a lot more than we care to admit. It's just nepotism stops people from creeping to the top. I don't know. Now, within the contralto voice type category are three generally recognised subcategories. These are the coloratura contralto, the lyric contralto and the dramatic contralto. So let's have a look at the coloratura contralto. The coloratura contralto is an agile voice specialising in florid passages. Well, that's it, specialises in florid passages. The coloratura contralto was a favourite voice type of Rossini's, apparently, and many of Rossini's roles were written with this type of voice in mind. And we have some examples here. We have Angelina in La Cenerentola. Cenerentola. Cenerentola? Cenerentola. Cenerentola. Cenerentola? Cenerentola. Non più me sta tanto il fuoco, sta rossa la gorge giorno. No, no, no. And we have Isabella in Italiana in Algeri. And that's again by Rossini. And this role may also be sung by a mezzo soprano. For those of you who are very observant and may have noticed that I mentioned this in the Mezzo Soprano lecture. Now let's go on to the Lyric Contralto. A brief bit of information about this. The Lyric Contralto is a voice lighter in timbre, lighter in timbre than the Dramatic Contralto and probably the Coloratura Contralto. The point is Lyric Contralto, light timbre generally. And Lyric Contraltos are heavily utilised in both French and English operatic repertoire. Also, many of Gilbert and Sullivan contralto roles are best suited with a lyric contralto voice, apparently. And Marmos in The Tenderland is a notable lyric contralto role. If I can, I'll get an example of this now. I'm sorry. 
Now let's have a look at the dramatic contralto. So this is the deepest, darkest and most powerful contralto voice. The dramatic contralto voice is heard in much of the German operatic repertoire. They like big thick sounds, don't they? Erda in Der Ring des Nibelungen and Gea, Gaia in Daphne are both good examples of the dramatic contralto. I am so sorry if I'm pronouncing all these wrong. Gaia. Gaia? Wait, A and E, it's like... So I think it's Erda in Der Ring des Nibelungen and Gaia in Daphne. And these are both good examples of the dramatic contralto. Other examples of contralto roles in the standard operatic repertoire include the following. Auntie, Landlady of the Boar in Peter Grimes by Britain. And this may also be sung by a mezzo-soprano. <laughs> The Countess and the Queen of Spades by Tchaikovsky. Again, this may also be sung by a mezzo-soprano. <laughs> we have Erda in Das Rheingold by Wagner. <laughs> Siegfried by Wagner. <laughs> We have Gea in Daphne by Strauss. We have Malcolm in La Donna del Lago Rossini and this may also be sung by a mezzo-soprano. Have Margaret in Wojciech by Berg. We have Rosina in The Barber of Seville by Rossini, and this may also be sung by a mezzo soprano. We have Ruth in The Pirates of Penzance by Gilbert and Sullivan. By Gilbert and Sullivan. I made up my mind to go with a kind of piratical maid of all the world. <laughs> so let's summarise this. In this video, we've explored the contralto voice and the roles it is assigned in traditional opera narratives. We've looked at the coloratura contralto, the lyric contralto, and the dramatic contralto. We've also learned that true, genuine contralto voices are rare, and some of the roles assigned to contralto parts can sometimes be sung by the ever-versatile mezzo-soprano. For more about the mezzo-soprano, check out my video on the mezzo-soprano, where you will learn just how versatile they are. Stay tuned for the next lecture in this series on the operatic voice, where we'll be exploring the countertenor voice. No, we won't. We'll be exploring the castrato. No, we won't. We'll be exploring the countertenor voice. Ah... <sighs> Unsurprisingly, this countertenor vocal type affords a much wider play with gender in traditional opera. So I'm interested in finding out how this can be developed in modern operas too, and in a contemporary world where gender is not seen as so binary as it was in traditional opera narratives. I'll see you there.